But if you are, it'll be the most fulfilling. Um, the other good news is that uh, we're going to use um, a book to lead and guide our discussion, and that you can read the book if you want, but you do not have to. Even better. And really the goal is to try to get us to think and to reflect a little bit both together but also for ourselves about <clears throat> what it means about how we um, as Christians, but especially as Lutherans, um, understand the Bible to be. Um, one of the major divisions within Christianity, um, still to this day, involves how different sects of Christians understand what the Bible is. Um, and we'll throw around some words in a little bit that might get us there. Um, but the word that our ELCA uh, constitution actually says, and the thing that um, I would say we come with a very uh, open-minded believing is that the Bible is inspired. Um, now, what does that mean? A little bit of that is our goal of the next few weeks. And one of the, uh, there's a book that just came out this past year. Um, Rachel Held Evans is a former evangelical turned Episcopalian. Um, I've heard her speak a couple of times, and she's a great public speaker. She uh, grew up in Tennessee, so she's got a draw. We'll hear her in a little bit. I find her, her lilt very pleasing to my ears, so I hope it is to yours as well. Um, and she has uh, written a number of books uh, as more of a memoirist, um, as someone who is not seminary trained, which in some ways is a helpful advantage, but is well versed in the history of being a Bible-believing Christian, which I can't say I've ever been um, in using that those with that phrase or that parlance, Bible believing. So we're going to talk a little bit about what that means, um, and then um, go into some of the different chapters. She's decided to talk about the Bible in a way that divides it into separate kind of collections of stories. So today, God willing, and I don't run out of time, uh, we'll start with wisdom stories. Uh, and we'll talk about what those are. Next week, we'll do war stories and church stories, which I think will be nicely held together in tension. <laughs> Because uh, sometimes the church has its own warring madness. But um, I've been really impressed and, and uh, I've been really heartened spiritually by this book, both in that it's easy to read um, and also in the fact that it is, in my mind, it doesn't shy away from leaving unanswered questions, which I think can be a helpful tool um, in a book like this. And Sue Swing has uh, greatly ordered some copies, so if you'd like to purchase it, um, and read uh, along or read ahead. I find it reads fast. I popped out under a page a minute um, that uh, it might be a good discussion or uh, you might be interested in having it for your own personal reading and edification as well. But before uh, we get started in kind of talking about the Bible, I thought we'd start with what um, Rachel Hill Evans has said. So we're going to listen to the first two pages um, on the audio. And so we'll have her read to us. And as we're um, listening, I invite you to think, um, how have your thoughts and feelings about the Bible evolved over time? How, how, have you, how is your thinking about scripture, about the Bible, changed over time? The answer might be, it hasn't changed at all. It's the same as when I was six. It might be, whew, some of those things I believed when I was 25, I don't know if I can believe now. Or it might be anywhere in between. Um, but to think about that in your own personal life of faith as you listen to kind of the introduction here. And uh, I hope you enjoy her drawl as much as I do. Introduction. Once upon a time. Once upon a time, there lived a girl with a magic book. Like many other books, this one told tales of kings and queens, farmers and warriors, giants and sea monsters, and dangerous voyages. But unlike any other, it cast a spell over all who read it. So they were pulled into the story, cast as characters in a great epic full of danger and surprise. From the book, the girl learned how to be brave like the shepherd boy David, clever like the poor peasant Ruth, and charming like the beautiful Queen Esther. She memorized the book's proverbs, which were said to hold the secret to a rich and happy life. And she sang the book's ancient songs, just as they'd been sung for thousands of years. She learned that with enough faith, you could topple a giant with a slingshot, turn water into wine, 
and survive three days in the belly of a great fish. You could even wrestle an angel. She learned, too, how to defend the book against its enemies, those who said its story wasn't true. She could fashion the book into a weapon if she wanted, and wield its truth like a sword. Rumor had it the book was divinely inspired, and she believed it, for every word she read echoed with the voice of God. When the girl met a teacher named Jesus in the story, she heard that voice even louder than before. So she promised to love and follow him forever. Jesus taught her to care for the poor, be kind to the lonely, forgive the bullies, and listen to her mother. He healed the sick and raised the dead, and said those who followed him could do the same. The girl never healed the sick or raised the dead, but still she believed. Then one day the story began to unravel. The girl was older now, with a mature and curious mind, and she noticed some things she hadn't before. Like how God rewarded the chosen patriarch Abraham for obeying God's request that he sacrifice his own son. Or how God permitted the chosen people of Israel to kidnap women and girls as spoils of war. After the famous walls of Jericho came a tumbling down, a God-appointed army slaughtered every man, woman, and child in the city. And after Pharaoh refused to release his slaves, a God-appointed angel killed every firstborn boy in Egypt. Even the story of all the Earth's animals taking refuge in a giant ark, one of the girl's favorites, began with a God so sorry for creating life, he simply washed it all away. If God was supposed to be the hero of this story, then why did God behave like a villain? If the book was supposed to explain all the mysteries of life, why did it leave her with so many questions? Deep down, she knew there was no such thing as crafty serpents and talking donkeys and that you can never fit every kind of animal on earth on a boat. Science proves the earth wasn't made in seven days, nor is it held up by great pillars, as the book claimed. There were contradictions in the various accounts of King David's reign, and even the stories of Jesus' famous resurrection didn't read like reliable newspaper reports. Perhaps, the girl reasoned, the story wasn't true after all. Perhaps, she feared, her book wasn't magic. With each question, the voice of God grew quieter, and the voices of others grew louder. These are dangerous questions, they said, forbidden questions, especially for a girl. They told her to fight against her doubts, but her sword grew heavy. They told her to stand strong in her faith, but her legs grew weak. Words that once teemed with life nettled her mind, and stories that once captured her imagination triggered her doubts and darkest fears. It was as if the roots of a beloved and familiar tree had risen up to trip her on the path. There was no map for a world suddenly rearranged, no incantation to light the road ahead. She was lost. And yet the spell remained unbroken. The characters, many more sinister now, wandered in and out of her life just as before, interrupting her work, her relationships, her plans. Old stories continued to be told, old battles continued to be waged. She couldn't get the ancient songs out of her head. She was still caught in the story. Like millions before her and millions after, she couldn't run away. In her unguarded moments, she found herself wondering, is the magic of the book really divine blessing, or is it, in truth, a curse? And that's when the adventure really began. Controversial, sacred, irrelevant, timeless, oppressive, embattled, divine. The Bible conjures all sorts of adjectives among modern day readers, and yet its magic is indisputable. For every time we tease about forbidden fruit or praise a good Samaritan, we betray our fascination with this ancient collection of stories and poems, prophecies and proverbs, letters and laws, written and compiled by countless authors spanning multiple centuries, and cited by everyone from William Blake to Beyonce. The Bible has been translated into more than 2,000 languages, its tales inspiring the art of Shakespeare and Steinbeck, Zora Neale Hurston, and blind Willie Johnson. Its words are etched into our gravestones, scribbled onto the white posters we carry into picket lines, and strategically incorporated into our dating profiles. Civil rights activists quoted heavily from the biblical texts, as did the Christian segregationists who opposed them. 
The Bible's ancient refrains have given voice to the laments of millions of oppressed people and too often provided justification to their oppressors. Wars still rage over its disputed geographies. Like it or not, the Bible has cast its spell and we are caught up in the story. What did you notice? What stuck out? What felt uh, like it resonated? Yeah, what, what makes it great for you, Trudy? Uh, the fact that she raises so many of the questions that have circulated through my mind. Yeah, yeah. She's able to, in that, her brevity is pretty cool, but also just her ability to, to name what I think many of us wrestle with <laughs> as Bible readers, and also as <coughs> believers in God. Um, whether or not we believe in the Bible itself, as uh, the term Bible believing gets tossed around a lot, um, uh, often in more conservative Christian circles, um, if I had a friend who, who growing up would say, if the Bible says it, well, I believe it. That seals it. <laughs> no debate. <laughs> and so I, I wouldn't say that we're Bible believers in that sense, but we do believe that the Bible is the inspired um, word of God. Um, I printed off some handouts in the, on the side table over there. We don't need them for now, but uh, you're welcome to take one and, and use it in your own kind of, give me a nice Lenten practice if you haven't found one that fits well yet. Um, I haven't figured out what mine fully is and we're two weeks in, so <laughs> fear not y'all, including virtual land. Um, but to think about it, how, how have your thoughts or feelings about the Bible changed? Um, over your lifespan? Well, as you get older and you have uh, more reasoning power and you have more um, information that you've learned, the, the things don't jive as well. Yeah. So the, the, more, the more you learn, <laughs> the more unlearning, <laughs> or at least wrestling with you have to do. Yeah, Diane and I Well, I was just going to add what, to what Nancy said, because when um, I was little, I thought everything in the Bible was good, and, huh. you know, all the, all the good stories were in the Bible, and nothing bad was in the Bible, but as you get, that means good as you get older, and hopefully a little wiser, you realize that it's not, all, it, the stories aren't all good stories. Yeah. They're challenging. Very challenging. Yeah. Um, Carl, and then Sue, and then her. Yeah, I think some years ago I heard the expression, we don't take the Bible literally, we take it seriously. Mm. And uh, it's there's a power of truth and metaphor that you can't really communicate with facts. Yeah. And I think we're struggling with that reality today. And that's within Christianity and totally <laughs> without it, too. I mean, outside of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sue, Herb, and then Sharon. Um, so actually, what Carl said, um, I kind of want to build off that. And just my experience with people who aren't part of this church is that the understanding is actually shrinking. And I'd be curious over the next couple of weeks to talk about how do you talk about your faith and talk about the Bible with people who aren't willing to go beyond their formative understanding of the Bible and the fear of going outside of those parameters mm -hmm. and how that affects, it makes it even smaller. I mean, I, I have an awful lot of people who see the Bible that way and um, refer to my faith as pretend, you know, mm -hmm. right? because it's not literal. It's not a literal interpretation. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of mm -hmm. people like that. and. They would never read this book, for one thing, and would be threatened by it, and I would just be curious to talk about that, because there's an awful lot of Christians out there, and we don't all think the same. Yeah. Yeah, and, and to play off of that a little bit, you know, part of, I've read some of Rachel Held Evans' other books, mm -hmm. and so she's not going to unpack her full story <laughs> for us in these pages. She mm -hmm. unpacks part of her story, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. But that uh, what's powerful to me is that um, 
that there's a specific niche, and we at St. Matthew's fit into that niche that could really benefit from this, but there is a lot of resistance too. And so how do we hold those, those pieces? How do we not use this book as a weapon <laughs> against those who might use the Bible as a weapon against our belief um, or different believing? Yeah, her. I find it interesting. All of the things she posed were the thoughts that ran through my mind even as far back as eighth grade. I had a <clears throat> lot of interest in science. But the thing that has really changed over the years, even in eighth, eighth grade, I posed some of these same questions to our pastor. And I got the response, yeah, there's some really strange stuff in there. And today, <laughs> those issues are being, in my personal experience, are much more addressed by the clergy in general, mm. willing to discuss that. Even a few years ago, I spoke with one pastor, well, we don't talk about that stuff with our people because it'd be pretty confusing, and we're getting away from that, and we're taking the risk of actually talking about it. Thanks for those words of affirmation and hope. Um, I need them sometimes as a pastor. Yeah, that we have made progress. Yeah, who here... Who here asked a question of their pastor in maybe middle school or high school about the Bible or about something they believe and got shot down or told, don't ask that, or some sort of similar response? Anybody? I'm sorry that the church has failed you that way. Um, and I grew up in a really wacky part of the Lutheran church. I grew up in rural Minnesota in a Scandinavian enclave. Um, where the only ecumenism was when the Lutherans went to the Catholic spaghetti dinner and the Catholics didn't come to eat lutefisk. That was, <laughs> that was it in my town. Um, very, you know, um, and, and everything about church was about right moral behavior. It's like acting the right way, you know, that uh, my dad still says, Matt, you don't talk like a minister. <laughs> um, I said, yeah, you're SOL. Um, but, uh, <laughs> But, for whatever reason, my pastors never said to me, that's a dumb question, or you don't underst won't understand that, so don't even bother, you know, or didn't say, why are you asking that? I I've come to see that as I've matured in faith and, and worked and led in the church to be just like the greatest gift I never knew my home congregation could have given me, yeah. that there was space to hold my questions. Um, and I like to try to think that this is space where we can hold that too. Sharon. Yeah, well, I was raised a Roman Catholic, so um, they basically kept us from the Bible. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm. it, there was, you only got anywhere near that in church. It was read to you. It was never really explained to you. You didn't get to study it. So when I got to college, I took a year's worth of the Bible as literature. Yeah. Because... And of course, my professor, Standish Henning, said right up front, listen you, if you came here for religion, uh-uh, this is literature, we're talking literature, if you're, if you're here for religion, there's the door. <laughs> so so I, I really got the Bible as literature, which I, you know, so totally, really am, am, am I'm so lucky that I did get that whole year of the Bible as literature, but having, having come to it from that angle, I so now appreciate the way the Lutherans welcome, you know, and, and enjoy looking at it in depth, talking about it, turning it over, you know, seeing all of the sides of it, because it's, it, there's a rich life there. There's, yeah. there's a lot to offer, and um, I think, you know, I, I didn't have any of that. Yeah. And, 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 and I think reading the Bible as literature is some of the best theology we can do. So oh. I think your professor was full of, yeah. <laughs> full well, of it well, when he said there's no religion here. You well, know. actually, his, his father was a, was a minister, and, and he, you know, honestly oh, that, did that give us... It. He did yeah. give us, yeah, he, he did give us religion, really. Yeah. yeah. Um, I had a, a, a transformative experience in college also. We were required to take a Bible, uh, not as literature, but um, you know, a Bible class our uh, freshman year. And back in the 60s, the uh, the thing was the historical critical method of biblical study. 
Well, I had no idea what that was, mm -hmm. but it was just so freeing for me to look at the Bible, first of all, in a context. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I had mentioned to a group of my friends that that was probably my favorite class or the most important class to me in my college career, even though that wasn't in my major subject. And one of my dear friends said, I hated that class because it shook my belief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so when we read the Bible, <laughs> especially when we read it, so there's, there's many different ways of reading scripture. One of them is devotionally. And I think that's what, for most of us probably growing up in church, if at all, we learn to read the Bible devotionally. What is Jesus saying? You know, what is, what does this say that has relevance to my life? What is this story asking me to do or to change or to, you know, reflect on? That's awesome for reading the Bible. And it really gets stuck in the mud if you read a passage about murdering innocent children and you're trying to read the Bible devotionally. And so most of the time, the devotional tools that we have used throughout the church have avoided <laughs> those stories. Mm. It's why in Sunday school, we kind of skip over the, the part of the, uh, and, and this is still true today, children's story Bibles pass over the part of the Exodus story where the flood drowns all the Egyptians. Yeah. Moses and the people made it through, hooray, and seen. <laughs> yeah. You know, because there's a part of that that, that wants us to learn the stories but not the shadow side, you know? And, and so it's not surprising that those things happen. Um, and the, reading the Bible literarily is another way to read it. Um, the way that Lutherans, I think, like to read it is, um, the way Luther described it is, the Bible is the manger that reveals Christ. So it's a little bit like if the Bible were a flashlight, and you ever play flashlight tag as a kid? Mm -hmm. um, the Bible is a flashlight, and theoretically, for Luther, anytime you open it up, you'd be shining God's love out. <laughs> now, that's a little bit harder when you're in a story about um, infant sacrifice on stones. In fact, the green book in our hymnal didn't have that psalm in it. Our new red book does. What song is that? The psalm that has, um, psalm. you shall cast the children's head against the stone. <laughs> So we've done a lot of selective editing throughout our lives. But um, we would say that the Bible is inspired as it reveals that light to us. And what inspires Joanne might be different than what inspires Dave. It might be different than what inspires Diane. You know? And so um, that's the place where I think it's always important to read the Bible together. <laughs> um, reading it alone can be dangerous to your spiritual health. Um, Carl. It's interesting because the word inspired in the confessions of the ELCA was very debated. Huh. And it only won by two votes. And the words that the so-called Lutheran theologians wanted to push was revealed. Revealed as inspired. Instead of inspired because of verbal inspiration and fundamentalism and yeah. that word. So I think that's, so I've kind of grown up trying to hold on to that word, which right now is just kind of, just like the word evangelical got thrown in there. They didn't want that, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When they formed ELCA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, the introductory chapter of Rachel L. Devon's book, Inspired, puts forth the idea that, and she uses it across denominations, so as an ecumenical word rather than as a limiting word. Right. To say, when we look at the Bible as inspired by God, it allows us to see that there's humans that have touched these texts, sometimes um, perhaps harmfully, that there are stories that involve humans, so it's not just all, like Diane said, the Bible is just not all good <laughs> um, in and of itself, but also um, that there's some work of the Holy Spirit that happens, so that, that it's not just human. That's where the word inspire comes from. Yeah, reveal, you know, and so um, she wants us to consider different words that people use. So some people would say the Bible is inspired. Which means spirit. Filled with spirit. Some people would say the Bible is inerrant, without error. That's a little trickier. Our Missouri Synod siblings 
Um, that's in their constitutional documents. Um, the Bible being without error is a little bit different than the Bible being infallible. Which is um, what the Catholic Church also says about the Pope, um, historically. So to be inerrant is about its history. To be infallible is about its present message. You know, the, the message you, you... And that's... Whew, that's a scary one for me because if we read the same Bible passage... Uh, I've done enough Bible studies with most of y'all to know that... Um, we have different interpretations on things. So which one is fallible and which one's not? And does the fact that I wear a little piece of plastic and went to some graduate school mean that my interpretation is somehow better? You know, like, those are all things that I think about when I think about if we bring the word infallible in, that's a lot of pressure on me. I don't know if I want. <laughs> um, and it can be limiting to saying that you all have valid interpretation and perspectives. Um, trustworthy, that's a whole different category. Can we trust what the Bible says about God, about humanity? Authoritative. It has authority over us. That can be hard, especially we're living in a time where, where everyone's questioning authority all the time. Um, sacred. What does it mean that the word holy appears before most of our Bibles on the cover? Um, does it mean that we don't let it collect dust? That's what my parents taught me. <laughs> if it's holy, it better be, better be speck and span. <laughs> As opposed to, you know, revered or honored. Is the fact that I'm losing pages out of my Bible mean I'm not treating it as sacred? No. Signing it. Writing in it? Yeah. Signing it? That was in the news a few weeks ago. We won't go down that rabbit hole. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, oppressive. When we think about the history of Scripture and how it's been used to oppress peoples, uh, the Christian Inquisition in history. Um, and, as Sherry brought up, who has access to it can be oppressive also. Um, and then outdated. This one comes up every time we teach ninth grade confirmation, Gretchen, Housie, and I. Um, we ask the ninth graders, what do they think about the Bible? And at least four or five of them mention something as being out of touch or outdated or way back then and not feeling relevant. And I think that's a, that's a piece that's worthy of our thinking about too. Any of those words stick out to you as being particularly um, helpful or unhelpful? Yeah, her. A lot that comes to my mind though is with so many translations out there, we find contradictions between translations. Yeah. So, so true. how do we think about it? Yeah. yeah. And the translation piece is, is hard that way, um, especially when it comes to some of. I'll, I'll review a little secret. <laughs> the Bible is a political document. <laughs> um, and what happens is that. that I could open up a text and read it one way and come up with my own translation to help me fight my fight. <laughs> and then vice versa, another issue that feels popular, you know, if it's, it's in the realm, people will use it to their own, their own discretion. So, so transla translationally, um, the Bible can feel a little bit, what's the word, um, reductionist, <laughs> can feel a little bit whatever works for you. A little bit of like uh, helter-skelter when it comes to those things. Because the translations can affect how we see it as inspired or infallible. And then when we encounter translations that, that are used to prove other points not related to the story themselves, um, I think that's a hard one. Romans 1 is a, is a, a primary text um, that is super hard because uh, the words that are involved um, in our translations get connected to sexual orientation in ways that might not fully reflect the historical context of Paul. You know, and so, so how do we read con translation versus context versus the authority? So if the Bible has, you know, do we want it to have authority over you know, uh, Romans 1? We could spend 18 hours. <laughs> I'll encourage you to read it on your own. Um, but that how we translate the word porneia. 
You know, that's the word that often gets translated as, um, what is the word? La, la, what's, oh, pornography. Shoot. Por I mean, it's where we get the word pornography, but it's in the list of all the vices that Paul chooses. He chooses porneia. Uh, that's the word he uses for um, being sexually loose. Lust. Lustful. But what happens when we translate that promiscuous? <laughs> you know, there's all of these different ways that translation can be um, used in hard ways and challenging ways. Um, we're not going to answer all those questions today <laughs> or in the coming weeks, but, but to, I, I encourage you to think about what words do you use? What are the adjectives you use to describe the Bible? Uh, my number one one is fun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I, I don't expect you to be the receptacle of all knowledge. But Good. To, uh, <laughs> but are there similar problems with, say, the Koran or, I don't know, other, what other texts there are yeah. in other religions? That's the only one that pops into my head. Yeah. I mean, with there being contradictory type stories and yeah. Yeah, the um, the Jewish tradition, um, because we share the 39 books of what we call the Old Testament, what they would call the Tanakh together, um, the rabbis love the contradictions. In fact, they write pages and pages and pages on them. And so they see them not as an obstacle to faith, but they see them as, let's wrestle with this and grow deeper in our appreciation and love of God. So that's very different than what most Christian churches, I think, would say <coughs> about right wrong. that we're looking for, for right, wrong, we're looking yeah. for, mm -hmm. you know, specific. The rabbis, we just, in our uh, Tuesday night Exodus group, we were reading the story of the plagues and the Passover. And I pulled up seven different things from the Talmud, which is the oral teachings of the, the Hebrew Bible, about the rabbis' interpretations. And they ranged everything from... The Egyptians really didn't die. Pharaoh floated, and he shows up again, and he's actually Nebuchadnezzar reincarnate. Oh. Oh. Two, um, you know, this is a good moral teaching for us. How do we walk on muddy ground that's recently been wet and not lose our footing? <laughs> Two, yeah, God didn't kill the uh, Egyptians. That was all Pharaoh's doing, and if they were collateral damage, well, they must have done something bad that we don't know about. So, so within Judaism, there's a much greater okayness with the tension. The Quran, and, and this is where I, I don't want to speak authoritatively, but my understanding is the Quran um, is the inspired words given from Allah, God, to Muhammad, the prophet. Peace be upon him. And, um, and so there's less room for interpretation within the Quran, because it's seen as direct prophetic discourse. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that within mainstream Islam, there's trust that, that Muhammad the prophet got it right, and that what was written was intended by God. It's not so it's not so history. much of a history. Correct. Then. Right. Yeah. Okay. Even though history he was is illiterate. very short in the Quran. Right. Even, and especially because he was illiterate, it makes that even even a stronger case for believing its authority. Exactly. Um, now that's not to say there aren't parts of the Quran, like there aren't parts of the Bible, that we wish weren't so clear about violence toward enemies, or, or vice versa, or whatever the case may be. Um, and the two main sects of Islam, Sunni and Shia, come down to an interpretation of the proper successor from, yeah. the, from the Prophet Muhammad, whether it's uh, direct from his family line or some of the leaders of the early Islamic Church, so um, certainly the, that interpretation caused, you know, two branches of, yeah. of Islam. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, so this is, the Bible as we know it is a little bit more complicated because it's different genres. Right. <laughs> so then we have some books that would be very similar to the correct. Words from the prophets given from God. 
But even those are rooted in history and context and other pieces. Um, so Mormon that, is the same thing, Book of Mormon. Right, and the Book mm -hmm. of Mormon is a whole, uh, and again, that's more direct Very discourse between time. God and a, a unique individual. Yeah, Where here, we don't have the history. Yeah. Um, so let's conclude the introduction <laughs> there for now. Um, and again, the, I really appreciate that uh, there's a reading guide that Rachel Hadovitz has written along with her book. And she said that she attended this book for book clubs. So good job, you're all a book club now. Um, but uh, there's some really awesome, like kind of creative ways to engage. Uh, and if you want to have some homework, one of the ways to do that is to say, um, she encourages us to write our own Bible story. So write your own personal experience with the Bible beginning, once upon a time, a little boy named Carl opened up a book that his father gave him when he was in third grade, you know, um, whatever. But then, what are your own Bible stories? Where has it been helpful? Where have you said, to heaven with you, or something other than that? You know, that, that those might be helpful ways to explore. Do you see the Bible as storybook, as guidebook, as handbook? And those are some of the images that, that she talks about in the book, and through the chapters as well. But um, I want to spend the last few minutes of our conversation focusing on um, the chapter of this book that she calls Wisdom Stories. And does anyone have a clue what the Bible's wisdom stories are? Job. Job. Proverbs. Proverbs. Psalms. The Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs. That's the Bible's epic love poem. There's also um, Ecclesiastes. Lamentations. Lamentations can fit under that. Um, there's all sorts of books that are considered by Bible scholars to be wisdom books or wisdom literature. Now, that can be a little bit um, confusing. But the two things that Rachel Held Evans wants us to wrestle with in the chapter about wisdom stories are twofold. One is that the Bible itself is self-contradicting when it comes to lots of the Proverbs. In fact, there's a couple of Proverbs that if you read the first half of the proverb and the second half of the verse, they say the exact opposite thing. And so when you've grown up in a world or when you've lived in a world where reading the Bible means it is authority and it is infallible and it is inerrant, well, which of those is right? It's like mixing sweet and sour. <laughs> the East <laughs> understands it very well. Yeah. Yin and yang. Yeah. And so the subtitle of this chapter for her is, you reap, when, you reap what you sow, which is in the Bible, except when you don't. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so part of this chapter is, how do we live in the tension? Right. Um, and one of those stories of great tension and great struggle um, and great, sometimes, problem um, are those wisdom stories, especially the stories of Job. Um, and one of the primary ideas that she wants to get across here, and we're going to listen to her telling of the Job story in just a second, um, is she writes, the Bible of my youth in so many ways was set up to fail. And so as you're thinking about how you've grown up or lived reading the Bible, how has, and, and I think we talked about it as we went around, the church has often, even among mainline Protestant ELC and Lutherans, has set us up to fail. Um, because we aren't able to engage the tension, or the, the both and, or as Carl said, the sweet and the sour. <laughs> you know? um, the fact that the Bible here, especially in these wisdom books, is not shooting straight arrows of, this is what God says but it's reflecting the variety of lived experience. Because who here has had an experience where you, rep, you wrecked, you reaped what you sowed? I feel like I could say, yep, and sometimes that's good, <laughs> and sometimes that's not so good, you know? Um, but also, who here among us has, has wondered about suffering? If I've done all these things right, why is there still cancer cells exploding in my friend's pancreas? You know, and, and so, so how do we, as people of faith, engage the Bible in those circumstances? 
where it doesn't jive, maybe especially with our experience. Um, do you know, I just want to get a read before we hear the Job story. Do you all feel that, like, the notion of the Bible being contradictory to itself or having tension with itself, does that feel like an idea that is, is not new to you? Do you feel like that's a, is that something that's relatively new in your experience as faithful people, or is it something you've had for most of your life? Yeah, Chris. Um, for me, um, I pretty much did what Diane had said, but everything in the Bible was really good. Yeah. And um, I probably did not have as much of a um, church background as a lot of people. I mean, we went to church, but not on a regular basis. Um, that might have actually helped you, honestly. Well, I do think it did. Now, when I look back on some things, um, I was never able to be confirmed because I had a father who wouldn't take me there. The church wouldn't allow any kind of things if you didn't go to Sunday school, church, and confirmation. That was it. And so, um, but I always had this this faith. Yeah. And I think, um, really, pretty much through coming to St. Matthew's is when I started to explore more. Bible reading before that, I mean, I literally thought that, and I'm pretty much a black and white person, so that's probably part of this, is that I thought everything in there was literally what. And then about well, 15 years ago, I decided I was going to read the whole Bible. Yeah. And, and I've done that now twice, and doing that, I am just as confused <laughs> as when I started this whole process. And um, part of the reason that I love this church so much is because I have gotten so many different things through so many different Bible studies through a Sue with you that makes it much more understandable. And I'm still probably, I, I've decided I'm probably never going to ever get there where I totally understand it. Yeah. And like you say, I think in some ways, some of my stuff that I don't know is probably good because I don't see things sometimes the way other people do. Yeah. You yeah. know, because I, I wasn't brought up. I have a friend who was brought up, um, Missouri Senate Lutheran, um, went to school and everything, and literally, not, you know, for years, has not really gone to church because of so much stuff. Yeah. You know, so I feel that that's kind of has faith. But, you know, doesn't, you know, you know, practice. Yeah, and, and this is why I like to use the word fun to describe the Bible, <laughs> both sarcastically, but also, you know, that, that it, it, it has faith go alongside it. You know, that your faith and your Bible reading have gone hand in hand, but that um, they aren't necessary for our salvation, right? So to understand every word of the Bible to figure out the meaning to the answer of the book of Job is not the thing that St. Peter, if St. Peter's even at the pearly gates, is going to ask us. Um, you know, and so to separate reading scripture from getting it right, I think it's, it's a continual work of un, unwinding and unraveling that I, the pastor, am called to do and to accompany people along with. Because... Because again, I'm always amazed at our Bible says what what comes out that I didn't expect. Are the pearly gates in Scripture? <laughs> it depends on how you read Revelation, Pastor. Uh, Amen. But uh, I want to have I love the way that she has written the Job story, and so I want us um, to uh, go here and see what she says about it. I hope this is right. The Debate, yep. a screenplay. Interior, cafeteria, day. Red plastic trays glide down the food bar. We watch from above as a pair of hands, shrink-wrapped in poly gloves and glowing with an ethereal light, pass steaming plates of today's special under the sneeze guard. Mashed potatoes and mystery meat. We hear the familiar convivial din of clinking silverware and distant conversation. Cut to a long table, sparse and utilitarian, with nine seats on each side, all empty save one. Job, mid-thirties, sits alone at the center. He stares blankly at his food, shoulders slumped. 
His Oxford and Tweed fit the profile of a professor, humanities judging by the absence of a tie, but his matted hair and three-day growth could get him mistaken for a hungover student. On the wall behind him, a smattering of flyers advertised sorority balls, lectures, and cheap apartments. An inspirational poster features a calico kitten hanging precariously from a tree limb. Hang in there, it says. Coeds pass in front of the table, lost in the chatter. A woman, with an armful of papers to grade, walks briskly toward the table, heels assaulting the floor. But the minute she spots Job, she freezes, then does an about face to clop, clop, clop away. Job doesn't notice. More coeds pass by until finally Eli approaches the table with a tray in his hands and sits down cautiously next to Job. They are close in age, but Eli's beard is obviously intentional. The sort of extracurricular activity he brags about in his faculty bio, along with his interest in foreign films and craft beer. Eli takes Job in. He starts to speak, then thinks better of it, poking at his mystery meat instead. The two sit in silence until Bill arrives with a paper bag lunch and takes the seat on the other side of Job. Bill, late 60s, has the wizened air of a longtime professor who has survived his fair share of inept administrations. He nods a greeting to Eli, who returns it, then to Job, who does not. He pulls out a peanut butter sandwich and takes a bite, content with the quiet. Father Z is the last to arrive, having walked from the divinity school. The 50-something wears a collar under his blazer and carries a plastic container of mixed greens and a plastic fork. Before sitting, he rests his hand for a moment on Job's shoulder, as if to offer a prayer. No reaction from Job. Father Z takes a seat next to Bill, so the four colleagues form a single outward-facing row, a sad little tableau. No one sits across from them. Finally, the silence becomes too much for Eli. He pulls a greeting card from his jacket. It says, with sympathy, on the front. No envelope. Eli. We got this for you, man. It's not much, I know, but under the circumstances, we just, we wanted to do something. Job wakes from his stupor, takes the card, and opens it. Job, reading the card, deadpan. Remember, God will never give you more than you can handle. He puts the card on the table and falls back into a daze. Eli seems satisfied, but Bill makes a face. Eli to Bill. What? What's wrong with the card? Bill. It's a tad cliche, don't you think? God will never give you more than you can handle? What's that even mean? Eli, it's just a card, Bill. It's not a theological statement. Bill, everything's a theological statement. You of all people should know that. Bill looks to Father Z for support, but Father Z keeps his eye on his salad. Eli considers Bill's challenge for a moment. He has to lean over Joe to resume the conversation with his colleagues. Eli, lowering voice, look. This obviously happened for a reason. We know God is in control and that there is some divine purpose at work here. We don't need to spell that out for Job. He gets it. I figured a few words of comfort would encourage him to consider what he might learn from this time of discipline. Blessed is the one whom God corrects, so do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. For he wounds, but he also binds up. He injures, but his hands also heal. Bill. Well, that would have been a much better way to put it. The friends fall silent for a moment all of them eating except for Joe. We hear only the clink of flatware on plates and the distant hum of less awkward conversations until Bill can no longer keep his opinion to himself. He puts down his sandwich. Bill, really, this should serve as a reminder that we're all just one sin away from similar judgment. If anything, we ought to be urging Job to repent so God will show mercy to Job. You know, if you seek God earnestly and plead with the Almighty, if you're pure and upright, even now he will arouse himself on your behalf. Job doesn't respond. Bill returns to his sandwich, glad he got that off his chest. <laughs> Eli to Bill. Of what should Job repent? Specific sins? Bill. Aren't all sins specific, Eli? Eli. Well, sure, I guess I'm asking if you think Job did something definitive to bring this on, or if it's more like a result of God's wrath on his general sinful state. You said it could happen to any of us. Bill, yeah, but it didn't happen to any of us. It happened to Job. Eli, right, a lot. Bill, pride, greed, sloth. Eli, 
I'm not seeing Job exhibit any of those qualities. I mean, we all know him to be a man of Bill, porn, Eli. Porn? Oh, good grief, Bill. It always comes back to porn with you. You really think God's so enraged, Job got a peek at some boobs online, he sent a rainstorm and a drunk driver to the very road where an excruciating pause. Eli to Job. Oh, God, I'm sorry, dude. I'm so sorry. Bill, matter of fact. God rewards the righteous and punishes evildoers. The writings are clear on that. Does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? Certainly not. Whatever the sin, it was severe enough to warrant correction. We have to trust that God is just. Eli knows he should let it go, but he just can't let Bill have the final word. Eli, I agree, Bill, but it doesn't have to be direct cause and effect. I think it's entirely possible this was the result of God's general anger towards sin, like with the earthquake a few weeks ago, or the famine over in Sudan. Not necessarily a direct effect of Job's porn addiction. Father Z, Job has a porn addiction? Eli, according to Bill, everybody has a porn addiction. Bill, yep, because of feminism. Eli, to Bill, all I'm saying is I think it's entirely possible God did this to discipline Job's sins in general not one sin in particular, which should sober us all. Hardship does not spring from the soil, nor does trouble sprout from the ground. Yet man is born into trouble, as surely as sparks fly upward. Father Z, I don't think Job's convinced he's guilty of anything. At this, everyone at the table turns to Father Z, and then to Job. Job looks back at Father Z, as though suddenly seeing a stranger or trying to read a sign in a different language. Job, what? Father Z, do you think you are blameless, Job? Job, I, I don't know, blameless, I, Father Z, do you recognize this as an opportunity for repentance? Job struggles, then finally answers tentatively, Job, no, not really. Father Z, well, I'm sorry to hear that. Job, I don't think I've done anything wrong, Father. Father Z, in preacher mode. Oh, how I wish that God would speak, that he would open his lips against you and disclose to you the secrets of wisdom. He has already overlooked so much of your sin, Job. How can you claim to be blameless? If God confines you in prison and convenes a court, who can oppose him? You must repent, brother, and turn your heart to him. Put away your sins and God will work this out for good. He pauses for dramatic effect. Father Z, yes, even this can be redeemed for good. The group absorbs Father Z's sermon. Job puts his head in his hands. He wears a wedding ring. Bill, not to be outdone, tries one more point. Bill, I think we should consider that maybe this isn't just about Job's sins, but the sins of the ones actually in the accident. At this, Job lifts his head from his hands to look at Bill, and for the first time we catch a glimmer of emotion, utter anguish. Suddenly, everything stops. Complete silence. All the background clamor ceases as if someone has hit a mute button on the cafeteria. The fluorescent lights above the table throb, glowing brighter and brighter until nearly everything is blown out. The professors, startled, squint and shield their eyes. The silhouette of a cafeteria lady moves imposingly into the frame. She wears a hairnet and apron. Her hands, shrink-wrapped in polygloves, rest on her hips. Cafeteria lady. Enough, enough with this. Stop lying about me, you fools. You think because you've got a bunch of fancy theology degrees you can divine what I'm up to? Who keeps the earth spinning in her orbit and knows every dimension of the cosmos, huh? Who formed galaxies out of dark matter and brought life out of the sea? Who knows every strand of DNA and every plant and every animal and every person in the world? And who is acquainted with every human sorrow from the tears of a child to the groans of a slave who can fathom the depths of the ocean? Who can start or stop the rain? Who knows intimately the contents of every human heart? She waits. Cafeteria lady. That's right. Not you. So lay off my servant Job. He hasn't done anything wrong. He's blameless and upright, a man of kindness and integrity, which is more than I can say for the three of you. Stunned, the professors sit with mouths agape until Bill attempts to speak. He moves his mouth, but no sound comes out. Same with Eli and Father Z. The three enter into a frantic, soundless conversation 
as Job rises to his feet, tears streaming down his face. Cafeteria lady. Come on, Job. I know you've got some things to get off your chest. She walks out of the frame. Job follows with reckless abandon, nearly falling over his chair to get to her. The lights return to normal. The cafeteria sounds resume. But the three professors continue arguing without voices, employing dramatic gestures to compensate. At the center of it all sits an empty chair. Fade to black. Chapter four. Huh. So, <laughs> who were you in the story? <laughs> It's just good enough to let that sit on its own, isn't it? Um, one of the things that I think is powerful about her retelling of that story, which is the center section of the book of Job, where Job's three quote-unquote friends <laughs> um, try to advise him, is that all of them use the words of Scripture. And that um, she really hones in on that well. Um, which I think is, is an important piece of what we think about wisdom stories, is that they may not always be the most applicable uh, for us. It's, it's one reason that we often don't have sermons <laughs> on Proverbs. <laughs> but boy, we have a lot of confirmation verses, my own included, <laughs> that get plucked from Proverbs. They're a way of trying to make sense of the world, um, but they aren't necessarily universals. Um, and that can be challenging. Um, the word that, that Rachel Held Evans uses is that wisdom is circumstantial. And I really like that. And partially because um, within the legal system, circumstantial evidence is not acceptable. Um, which could raise actually more questions for us. Yeah, sure. Well, it's acceptable, but it's not considered weighty or uh, particularly persuasive. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's acceptable. You can cobble together a case based on circumstantial evidence. If you don't have a body, you can still have yeah. someone convicted of murder or manslaughter, but boy, it's really much harder. And, and um, you, you need the, the hard evidence. You need the physical evidence. You need testimony, you need eyewitnesses, and circumstantial evidence is not that. Yeah. Okay. And thank God that a sermon does not need, <laughs> does yeah. not, um, I mean, that sermons are purely circumstantial most of the time, but that, that notion of, um, that that's not necessarily how we have been, have been raised or formed or shaped to see the Bible as being circumstantial. Um, I love, uh, if you have the book, on page 99, um, she says this. The Bible of my youth was set up to fail because the Bible was promised and taught me to expect something the Bible was never intended to deliver, an internally consistent and self-evident worldview that provides clear, universal answers to all of life's questions. The more we learn, the more unlearning. Um, we have to do. Yeah. And, and she goes on to list, you know, that, that can range from um, big picture issues like climate change to personal issues like how to keep a marriage together um, to how to raise kids to, you know, all of these different pieces. And, and there is wisdom that can be gained, but it's not <laughs> universal wisdom. It's pretty contextual and pretty conditional. <laughs> and... Um, and sometimes those, those pieces of conditional wisdom can really be detrimental to you as Job's friends try to apply their theologies about God. And what, what we didn't hear in the little reenactment of the story, the beginning of Job starts with God making a deal with the tempter to get this all started. You know, so that's a piece that's missing. Um, any other thoughts or reflections or... Um, Can I share a small paragraph? Yeah, please do so. Um, from this chapter, which I highlighted because I thought it says exactly what Matt has been talking about. Um, when God gave us the Bible, God did not give us an internally consistent book of answers. God gave us an inspired library of diverse writings 
rooted in a variety of contexts that have stood the test of time precisely because, together, they avoid simplistic solutions to complex problems. It's almost as though God trusts us to approach them with wisdom, to use discernment as we read and interpret, and to remain open to other points of view. Yeah, I think it says it really well, and that's the whole book. Yeah, that's, yeah. You're, you're engaged. Yeah. So next week, come on back. Um, and uh, we're talking about, we're going to go out of order um, of the book, but uh, the chapters on war stories, violence, uh, and church stories, which I'm most excited about, because we all have our church stories. So um, thanks for engaging, and hope that this is fruitful, and and if you're interested in pursuing more, um, thanks for having time to the book available, too. Yeah. Uh, I think so.